All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd just like to welcome everybody who's joined us here this evening, particularly the uh, the several county groups that have joined us, the Anson, Beaufort, Brunswick, and Rockingham County Beekeepers. Uh, the Rockingham Beekeepers are our hosts tonight, um, thanks to, uh, to to Lindsay Kenyon and Catherine Holmes in Rockingham County, who really have done a lot uh, working behind the scenes to, to set this up and to get this established. Um, they, months ago, uh, asked to uh, have an update about what beekeepers should know about honeybee viruses and their effects on colony health. And I really can't think of a more fitting subject to talk about, uh, particularly at this time of year, because this is something that a lot of beekeepers here in North Carolina, but elsewhere as well, um, it's really, really uh, central to honeybee management, but it's also one of the most frustrating and mysterious and least understood aspects about bee health. Uh, and as we'll uh, learn tonight, we know a little bit um, about some of the, the viruses. We know very, very little bit about a lot of viruses, but how it all works together and what we can do as beekeepers um, is, is actually uh, fairly small and fairly limited. Uh, and so uh, we'll, what we'll do is arm ourselves with a little bit of knowledge about these uh, viruses and what we can do and what we still need to learn about them. So uh, before we talk about the viruses, just want to make a couple of brief announcements. Um, there's lots of things going on, on, on over the, the state. Um, starting tomorrow, in fact, the Mountain State Fair kicks off. So anybody who's up in the mountains, uh, make sure you go to Fletcher uh, at least uh, once this next couple weeks. Uh, as usual, there's going to be a, a honey display up there and a honey bee exhibit. Um, in fact, Jennifer Keller, our uh, apiculture technician extraordinaire, is going to be traveling up there this weekend, and so she'll be there. So make sure you catch that. If you're in the Winston-Salem uh, area in early October, of course, you have the Dixie Classic State Fair. Uh, and then if you're in the Raleigh area or really anywhere, don't forget to come October 17th to the 27th, the uh, North Carolina State Fair is going to have that huge display and the uh, NCDA, Don Hopkins and the apiary inspectors really go all out and just really work their tails off to make a, a fantastic learning ex exhibition at the State Fair as they do every year. So don't miss any of those. Uh, promoting bees and beekeeping and, and help your local beekeeper clubs. Uh, as usual, I also want to just uh, highlight for those that you may not know that you are amenable to some of these online formats. We have many online beekeeping courses through NC State through our bees network or the beekeeper education and engagement system. Uh, more information can be found on this link. Just go to our website, NC State Apiculture Program and you'll quickly find a link to, to bees. Uh, and there's a lot of new um, content on there. I'm constantly adding new courses, advanced courses, as well as beginner courses. So uh, be sure to check that out. All right, now I know I'm preaching to the choir, but uh, just to underscore the fact that we have had a precipitous decline in the number of managed beehives over the last decades. This is something that, this is a figure that we've see, all seen and something that we're all very well, well aware that after World War II, we had upwards of six million beehives in the U.S. Uh, right now, currently, it's estimated that we have about 2.3 to 2.4 million beehives in the United States. So there's been a, a very slow and steady decline uh, because of many different problems that beekeepers have been experiencing. More recently, these um, declines have been uh, better documented by the Bee Informed Partnership and other survey tools where they've been looking at the percent winter losses of the managed honeybee population uh, in this past year, that is 2012 to 2013, beekeepers lost upwards of 30% plus of their colonies over that winter. Uh, and so that's obviously something that is not sustainable. Um, beekeepers, as part of those surveys, they say 
something like 15% or so loss it would be sustainable for their management practices. So clearly twice that much is not sustainable for the long term. So there's a real emphasis on trying to overcome a lot of the problems that the beekeepers have been experiencing. Now what are those problems? Well, they're myriad. We all know this as beekeepers, uh, ranging from um, pesticides that we place inside the hives ourselves or that bees are encountering in their environment. Uh, Nosema, gut, uh, gut microsporidium, that's been uh, resurgent and very problematic. Um, the number one problem in the U.S., of course, and has been for several decades, is the parasitic varroa mite, but also nutritional problems, uh, lack of ample forage out there for the bees, uh, or lack of proper nutrition in general. But what we're going to focus on today are uh, the viruses. Uh, and so these are kind of little known, but, but per perhaps really central to the whole problem of colonies uh, collapsing and, and dying. Uh, and how exactly they are involved is still somewhat of a mystery. But I think we're on the road to really trying to elucidate some of these um, some of these problems that the viruses can be involved in either directly or indirectly and therefore overcoming them, we'll, we may be able to really take some, some active measures to, to keeping our bees healthy. So what are the honeybee viruses? Well, they, they are many and I do not for a moment pretend to be uh, an expert in this field. Uh, I am not a virologist. Uh, but uh, I know that there are three main families or groups of honeybee viruses that uh, infect honeybees. Uh, the coronaviruses, uh, the cystroviruses, and ifloviruses. Um, these are all, as you would, you know, different different families, different uh, branches on the on the evolutionary tree when it comes to viruses. They vary in size and in their um, uh, their their shape and um, the, the, the means by which they are able to infect the, the honeybee tissue. But by and large, uh, viruses, as, as you probably know, they are, uh, consist of a very simple, um, relatively speaking, a simple protein coat. So there's a, a, a coat of proteins that surrounds some sort of genetic information. So it's just a capsule, a protein capsule that protects the genetic information that's inside. And compared to most uh, living genomes, um, that genetic information is fairly small and fairly simple. Uh, and so there's actually a debate about whether viruses are alive or not because they can't reproduce on their own. What they need to do is uh, find a host, infect that host, and then use the enzymatic machinery within the host cell in order to replicate. Uh, but they, they are very, very effective at doing just that, as we'll see. Uh, but the viruses themselves are just this protein coat with genetic information in it that spread and kill um, a host cell and then so on and so forth. So to understand how all of this works, you really have to understand just a little bit about, about genetics. Now, the way that, that honeybee genetics works, of course, is that all living things, honeybees included, um, have DNA, and then that DNA is the, the blueprint of life. Uh, the DNA is then what's known as uh, transcribed into RNA, so it's kind of, um, it's made into a different type of molecule within the cell. That RNA molecule is then translated into protein. So in essence, DNA is the blueprint for making proteins. And then putting those proteins together in a particular way is how we make our bees. And then the bees come together and make a colony. So that's really all you have to know about honeybee genetics and why DNA is so important, the very genetic blueprint that underlies making proteins that make bees. Um, now when it comes to, to viruses, however, 
a lot of the honeybee viruses that we're going to be talking about today are, do not have DNA in them. It said that they, they have a protein coat with some sort of genetic information inside. They actually don't have DNA. They already have this kind of middle step between DNA and protein. They're consisting of RNA, that genetic information. Um, and so what happens is that these, uh, pr the protein coats are able to circumvent the, descent, the defenses of the host cell and then invade and then release that genetic material, the RNA, into the cell. And then that RNA then is um, translated into proteins and other, other um, it, it replicates the RNA strand itself. So it kind of hijacks the machinery inside the cell to do the bidding of the virus rather than the bee. And so what happens is that what is encoded in that RNA strand is to make lots more of the protein coats that coat the RNA um, genetic information and make lots of copies of ourselves. And then they make so many that the cell bursts and ruptures with, you know, millions of these new uh, virus particles that then go and infect new cells. And that's how the virus spreads, right? So this is going to become important when we talk later about um, the transmission and the, um, the detection of these different viruses. But just know that, that most of these viruses are RNA viruses and not DNA viruses, and they're just hijacking our, our bees to replicate more of themselves. So how do these vir how does an infected individual pass on these viruses to other individuals. Obviously, inside an individual, so if, if a bee is infected, then she will kind of continuously um, produce more and more viruses until she dies. Well, obviously, um, the virus needs to replicate among other individuals. It needs to hop to another host in order to continue um, survival. And so there's lots of different ways that these viruses can get around within a honeybee colony. And it's very scary, in fact, when you stop to think about it, because all of the viruses that we're going to be talking about today um, are transmitted very, very easily within and among colonies. So one path by which viruses can uh, be transmitted is actually through um, the process of mating. There are two viruses that have actually been shown to be in drones that can infect queens by mating with them. So by the actual insemination process of the drones, a, an infected drone can infect an uninfected queen. So you know, honeybees actually do have their own form of BD, I guess, which is um, uh, probably not so good uh, for them. But it's actually kind of a rare transmission route because drones die after they mate, obviously. So um, you don't really see that um, being a major transmission route. The two real main transmission routes for virus transmission is that when you have an infected queen, when the queen lays an egg, that egg is also infected. So as she lays that egg, that egg is already coming with most of these viruses that she's infected with. Therefore, the larvae, the pupae, and then her daughter offspring, the workers, um, if she's infected, then the offspring are infected too. Now, that doesn't mean that they're all going to be sick, as we'll learn later, that those uh, having virus and being sick is not necessarily one and the same. But if queens are infected, then that vertical transmission from one generation to the next is a very common means of passing on these viruses. Now, even if the queen isn't infected, and therefore there's no vertical transmission of the viruses, the, uh, the viruses can also be transmitted from one bee to another through horizontal transmission. So that is from one infected bee to another infected bee through food or fecal transmission. Um, or, as we'll learn, the, the major route by which one bee gets infected by another 
is through a vector, most notably the varroa mite. So this is one problem why varroa mites are really so insidious is that these viruses have been around for a very, very long time, but they weren't transmitted from B to B very easily. But because the, vi the varroa mites are, are piercing the, the skin and injecting these viruses into uh, the different bees, they're, they're able to spread those viruses much, much more readily. So we have um, the mating transmission route, we have vertical transmission, and we have horizontal transmission. The latter two are really the, the more important means by which virus spreads within and among colonies. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of the viruses. We'll start with some of the ones that are more common and uh, ones that, that you may see uh, more often. Um, and before we do, I just want to say that, again, we know um, a lot less about these than what we don't know. Uh, there's, there's so many unanswered questions for most of these viruses, particularly as they affect colony health. We know that they do in a general sense, but the specific ways uh, for many of them we, we actually don't know. So the, the first one here is uh, DWV, which stands for Deformed Wing Virus. Um, this is probably something, the, the one virus that most beekeepers really are aware of because you can see it. Unlike a lot of the viruses that we're going to be talking about, the form wing virus is symptomatic, that is, you can see the effect on the adult worker. And the symptoms are just that. The wings are deformed, so they're all crumpled up and shriveled up like that. Um, and obviously, this has a very, very profound effect on worker productivity. Mainly, she can't fly. So the, the worker herself, she can... Um, uh, perform some duties inside the hive, but she's not able to fulfill all of her duties, particularly when she becomes 21 days old and um, starts to um, do duties outside the hive and foraging. She's not able to conduct those tasks because her wings are non-functional. So this severely limits the lifespan of the bees and the overall uh, productivity of the colony. So when too many of these bees get deformed wings, the colony can really start to uh, go in a downward spiral and be very, very severely affected. Now, um, it is very, very common. Deformed wing virus is very, very common, even in colonies where the workers are not showing deformed wings. This is, again, what's really um, frustrating about these viruses is that the foreign wing virus can be present inside the colony, inside the bees, but their wings are not always deformed. Um, and so it often happens when the virus levels get too high or because this is one um, of the viruses that is very, very well spread horizontally by the varroa mite, this is often associated with high varroa levels. And so you can have the viruses around, but you don't really see these symptoms until the, the virus has really spread throughout the colony. Um, now, I said that, that um, this and other viruses are associated and, and vectored by the varroa mite, but, that, but you often see high levels of varroa mite, but not very low levels of deformed wing. Or you can see high levels of deformed wing, but you don't see a lot of varroa mite. So they're not um, hand in hand necessarily. Uh, so again, that makes it very difficult to, um, to try and pin down exactly how much deformed wing virus and what kind of problem that you might have within a given colony. But again, this is uh, a very serious virus because it is symptomatic and it does have um, significant problems on colony productivity. There's a question here about whether drones get deformed wing uh, virus. Yes, they do. They uh, clearly do get infected uh, by um, deformed wing virus. But to my understanding, and I, I could be very wrong about this, I'd have to go and, and double check, but I don't think they get the crinkly wings as readily as the workers. 
Maybe it's because they have a longer development time. Maybe it's because they're larger. Um, but I, I very rarely see a lot of shriveled up wings among the, uh, among the drones. But they clearly do um, carry the deformed wing virus because this is one of those viruses that has been shown to be transmitted through semen by insemination of queens. So, um, so the drones can get infected, um, but I don't think they're, they're quite as um, susceptible as it were to, to them, uh, which is not unsurprising because, again, uh, the drones are more preferentially parasitized by, by varroa mites, which, again, are these really excellent vectors of, of this and other viruses. Now, another uh, very common virus is the black queen cell virus. Now, this is something that unless you're actively raising queens a lot, and a lot of queens, um, you very well might not see. Uh, but if you ever are raising queens uh, or you're letting a colony requeen itself, and then something kind of weird goes on with the developing queen um, and the cell gets capped over, but the queen never emerges. And if you open up that cell, um, inside is often kind of this, this blackened, uh, dead, uh, where, uh, dead pupa where the development was kind of um, arrested during development at some stage. Uh, this is the symptom, the very symptom of black queen cell virus. So the real expression of this virus is really seen in the queens. But however, the adult workers carry it. It's just that they're asymptomatic. So they're carriers, but they don't show, as far as we understand, they really don't show um, any signs of, of being sick, uh, and which, is, which is kind of interesting. So the, the queens get sick when they develop, but during the adult stages, uh, uh, they can get infected. Uh, workers and queens can get infected, but they're by and large asymptomatic. Another interesting thing about black queen cell virus, and because we raise so many queens here at NC State for the purposes of research, we, we can get bouts of this where we lose entire graphs of our queens because of this. And, it's, and then, you know, we graft into that same colony again, and then they're all fine. So it's really, really um, hit or miss when the expression of, of black queen cell virus um, within developing queens. It's very, very weird. But uh, there, ha there has been some studies dating way back to the 60s that suggest that black queen cell virus um, is associated somehow with nosema. Now, because those studies were done in the 60s, uh, this was before the days when we had nosema serrana. Um, this was back when there was just nosema apis. We don't know what kind of association or how this association um, differs, if at all, with this new version of Nosema that we have versus the old version. We don't really know if Nosema vectors black queen cell virus or not. Um, it's very likely because um, what happens is that the virus enters into the, uh, the bee, the infected bee, through the gut. And so as Nosema is in the gut of the developing bee, it pierces the gut lining and probably makes it a lot easier for the black queen cell virus to kind of get into the hemolymph and, and reproduce. And so um, that's probably why we see that uh, association. But just simply taking care of your nosema problems is not necessarily enough to um, ward off the problems of, of black queen cell virus. So again, this is a very common one. Uh, but there are still a lot of, of questions to be answered when, when it comes to the, the real impact that it has on overall colony health. This is yet another virus that many people see, again, because it's symptomatic. Uh, this is uh, known as chronic B paralysis virus, or CBPD. Uh, this is where you go into a colony and you see these really darkened, almost kind of oily, hairless, um, just kind of just weird looking bees crawling around, adult workers. Um, 
they have these black shiny abdomens. Sometimes their entire bodies looks like they've just been, um, you know, somebody poured ink all over them and all of their hair is gone and they're often just kind of twitchy and they just look sick. Uh, and that's exactly what it is, that they are sick, that uh, chronic B paralysis virus is really um, problematic. But it tends to be very spotty. Um, you don't see a whole colony with bees that look like this. Um, you just see maybe one out of a thousand, um, you know, even in, in, in fairly common, uh, fairly high cases. You know, you don't see a lot of these symptomatic bees within the colony. But that doesn't mean, again, that this bee, this, you know, sister nest mate that's right here, even though she's not symptomatic like this one here, um, she could also be carrying the virus at high, fairly high levels. So there's a lot of what we don't understand about virus titers and how many copies of the viruses that, that an individual bee is carrying around versus um, when they're showing signs of being sick. So um, this isn't nearly as common as uh, deformed wing virus and black queen cell. Um, but it is, again, something that you can pick out and you can see. Um, I know a lot of beekeepers, um, and, and we're included, where if we go into a colony and we just see uh, a couple of bees that are like this, we actually just take them out of the colony, uh, just get them out so that they're not going to be uh, passing it along to others. It's probably, um, you know, bailing a, a rowboat out with a teaspoon but at least it's uh, something that you can see and therefore you can remove, hopefully decreasing the amount of, uh, of virus within the colony. Now here are these, uh, these two other um, viruses that are economically and uh, important for bee health, KBB and uh, ABPB. They stand for Cashmere B virus and acute bee paralysis virus. Uh, they're associated with each other, but these are some that we, we really don't have a very good foothold on. Cashmere bee virus was so named because it was first discovered in a different species, as an Apis serrana, in, ca in the Cashmere area um, of, of Asia. And so it was named after that, but it's also, this is the same virus that's found in, in Apis mellifera in our honeybees. Um, and then similarly, acute bee paralysis virus is another one. And the, these are both very important in the sense that um, the symptoms, we don't really know, but the, the, the guess is that they are quite virulent, that the bees just seem to die in large numbers and they just get thrown out of the colony. Um, if you are to see them before they die, they're often just twitchy and, um, and just they're not able to function very well, but that's not a very accurate uh, symptom. So I'm just going to put down kind of a, a question mark here. But, but these viruses seem to impact colony health. Exactly how, exactly why, um, not really sure. There have been some outbreaks, especially of uh, cashmere bee virus. There was a, um, a case several years ago, probably five years ago, in the Pacific Northwest, where there were a lot of uh, bee colonies dying off. They weren't sure why. There were tests run and found lots of cashmere bee virus. So again, there was this association, but it wasn't absolutely clear whether it was a cause or effect. But nonetheless, that um, it seems to be associated with, with colony ill health, um, the, these, two, these two viruses. The kind of closest cousin to the cashmere bee virus is a relatively new one, IAPB, or the Israeli acute paralysis virus. Again, uh, because this uh, virus was first newly described and discovered in Israel, not that it necessarily came from there. Uh, but it's very, very similar to um, cashmere bee virus. They're very closely related um, uh, taxonomically. So again, not really knowing uh, what the symptoms are of this, but they do seem to be associated with, with um, uh, bee ill health and, and workers dying off. 
Now, famously, the IEPV made a lot of headlines um, in 2007 when uh, this science paper came out. Just it was one of the first uh, scientific papers that came out testing CCD, colony collapse disorder, where IEPV was found in 83% um, of colonies that had collapsed, but in only 5% of colonies that were healthy, that were sitting right next to them. So there seemed to be this, uh, this strong association, not a perfect one, but a strong association of colony collapse disorder and this particular virus. I can say, though, that subsequent studies have, have um, also looked at this and have not found as strong an association. So uh, it was first thought that it, it could have been either the cause or perhaps like a really good indicator or marker of colony collapse disorder. But um, the, the subsequent uh, studies haven't really borne that out. That isn't to say that it's not involved, but that um, it doesn't seem to be as strongly associated as was first thought um, back uh, when it was first published. Now I also have to, I just, I just put this in about, uh, about 40 minutes ago um, because uh, this paper was just published today. Uh, this was something that was done in, in our lab in, in collaboration with uh, Olaf Ruppel's lab at um, UNC Greensboro by a postdoc there, Umberto Bon Cristiani, um, who has since moved on, unfortunately, but he has done some really, really nice work on Israeli acute paralysis virus. And um, not to go into too much detail, um, what he's shown is he's, he's starting to, to um, to elucidate some of the potential reasons why uh, these viruses can be really, really problematic for individual bee health. And he set up this, this bioassay where he could actually inject purified virus into pupae, into individual pupae, uh, developing worker pupae, and then watching over time the progression of the different tissues as they, um, they die off and get infected by this kind of growing infection. And so it's kind of like this really excellent bioassay by which he's able to, to follow the progression of disease um, within individuals rather than kind of at the colony level, which is much harder to do. Um, this graph over here on the right, I won't even pretend uh, to, to try and explain all of that. But um, he has a lot of really nice data that, that we've published that shows how the virus not only disrupts the development of the individual bee, but it does so by, by hijacking the actual enzymatic machinery within the bees themselves. And we said before that that's exactly how these viruses are able to replicate. But not only do they hijack their means of replicating themselves, they shut down the bee's normal function so that the, the cell doesn't do the work on behalf of the bee. It only does the work on behalf of the virus. So it's actually a lot more sinister in the infection, not by just growing more viruses, but by shutting down uh, the bees and presumably their immune systems. So there seems to be this, this real disturbance of the, the normal ways that bees function because of these viruses, which obviously relates to, um, to how they become sick. Now another virus that you, you uh, may be familiar with, everything we've been talking up till now, they infect uh, lots of different stages of the bees, uh, but are usually transmitted and carried around in the adult stage. But this virus, the Sacbrood virus, is one that uh, preferentially and specifically infects the developing stages of bees rather than the adult stages. And this is something that you can see very readily by um, having the brown dying larva inside the brood cell and oftentimes they curl up inside the cell, kind of like a, looking at the front of a canoe. And so they look just like this, 
curled up and, and brownish in color, and that's a real telltale symptom that uh, you're dealing with sac brood virus in the, in the developing uh, brood. If you pull that, um, that, that dying larva out, um, pretty much what it is is a, is a dried up um, uh, fluid filled bag. Uh, it looks like a sack. It looks like a water balloon uh, that's been filled up with fluid. Um, and that's because the virus has completely taken over and all that's left is kind of this outer shell of the larva that has long uh, since died. Um, there, there's really nothing you can do for sac brood virus, just like all of these other viruses. There are no chemical treatments, no antibiotics that are going to work, although we'll talk about uh, management practices here in a moment. Um, but fortunately, sac brood virus seems to be more of a stress-induced disease where the virus is, is, is around inside the colony, and if the, if the colony gets stressed for any reason, it gets chilled, they don't have a lot of food, um, the brood nest is overextended compared to the workers that's able to keep them uh, warm, especially over, over the nighttime, um, that's when you can see these kind of things flare up. So just maintaining a good, strong colony is, is usually the best way to, to mitigate having a, a problem with sac brood virus. So luckily, this isn't really all that virulent compared to, to some of the others. Okay, so those are our seven different viruses that we're going to talk about here. But um, this is a, a, um, a figure out of a, a really nice chapter from, from a book about um, honeybee health that was published a couple of years ago, um, edited by Diana Sanitero. Uh, and so you can see there are a lot more viruses that are known. Uh, and I'm not going to go over all of them because um, even though we don't know a whole lot about the ones that we just talked about, we know even less about the, ones, uh, the other ones that are listed here. Uh, but this figure shows really nicely how um, the transmission of these viruses, whether we know that they can be transmitted horizontally or vertically. And as I said, by and large, the ones that we talked about are transmitted in both ways, both through the queen, through the egg, as well as from worker to worker by vectors, most notably by varroa. If you look at um, this varroa association, you see that these positive indications that Varroa is usually positively associated with these important, um, uh, economically important viruses. And again, that association of nosema with black queen cell. So these transmission routes are really very all-encompassing, which is, which is very, very scary because um, it's very hard for us as beekeepers to stop queens laying eggs and to stop Varroa from passing these, uh, these um, viruses around. So it, um, it's pretty a pretty daunting problem. So I just want to go over some of the, the studies again that have uh, looked at viruses and colony ill health. Um, and so in fact one of the, the hallmark studies on colony collapse disorder was looking at 61 different variables and how each one of them is, was associated with bees that seemingly died from colony collapse disorder or those that were healthy. Uh, and many of those variables were, in fact, um, uh, viruses. But again, no single measure, viruses or any other measure, emerged as the smoking gun that seemed to be uh, very well associated with colony collapse. So um, while there were lots of viruses in these sick and collapsed colonies, um, there didn't seem to be one that showed up every single time. Uh, and so there seems to be a lot of interactions that are going on, making uh, elucidating this issue very complicated. Uh, several years ago, there was another paper that was uh, published by Jerry Broman Shank's group and, and others and, and colleagues looking at how an aridivirus and nosema together may result in colony collapse. And this is a figure out of that paper where compared to how the bees died off as controls that is uninfected with anything, 
when infected with both this aritavirus and nosema, they died off significantly faster. Um, however, uh, I should note that this was done really kind of in, in, the, in the laboratory in kind of a petri dish setting. And, and while interesting, subsequent studies have gone out and looked for this aritavirus. And um, apparently nobody else can find this aritavirus. This is one of the few honeybee viruses that seems to be a, a DNA virus rather than an RNA virus. And so uh, other surveys going out and looking for this same aritavirus, um, nobody else has really been able to find it. <laughs> So um, it doesn't mean that uh, there isn't a potential link and a potential problem with that. Um, it just is unclear as to how important and how prevalent it really is when it comes to our, our bees getting sick. This is another paper uh, that we were involved with uh, with lots of collaborators. Scott Corman was, was the lead on this out of Jay Evans' lab at the USDA lab in Beltsville, Maryland, uh, looking at strong colonies versus those that had collapsed and looking at all the interactions of all of these different viruses and other um, infective agents like Nosema apis and Nosema serrana. So again, strong colonies, seemingly healthy colonies can have lots of these different, uh, these different bugs. But um, these, the collapsed colonies seem to have slightly different combinations of these same bugs. So slightly elevated um, prevalence of Nosema apis, not Nosema serrana, uh, cashmere bee virus, uh, acute bee paralysis virus, um, and an increase perhaps in deformed wing virus. So, um, and again, but not all co collapsed colonies have the same combination. Not all healthy colonies have the same combination. So it's a very complex web of these interacting variables that can result in bees dying off. And so this is something that makes it very difficult to kind of give a recipe of this plus this plus this equals death versus not having those equals everything's fine. Uh, it's very, very complicated. So in general, the way that, that the conventional wisdom is really viewing colonies collapsing in, in general or just kind of bee ill health um, overall is that we have all of these problems that are facing uh, bees and beekeepers, virus being among them for sure. And in certain cases, you can have colonies dying off where virus is really playing the major role, that that's the major reason for a given collapse. But in other cases, you can have bees dying off in very, very similar ways, but instead it's actually due to varroa in association with nutritional problems or nosema or some other problems. So there seems to be lots of different routes to the same end and how viruses actually fit into um, some of those routes, not necessarily all of them, is I, I think something that needs to be uh, discovered and really well worked out with, with some more research. Oh, there we go. Um, so let me just go over a couple of, of those kind of next generation initiatives of, of what we're doing at NC State when it comes to uh, trying to understand these viruses. Um, and most of what we're doing is in collaboration with the Bee Informed Partnership. Uh, this is being run uh, through Dennis Van Engelsdorp and uh, the University of Maryland. But it's a very, very large scale nationwide collaborative effort something like 16, 17 different institutions that are all um, doing their part to try to better understand the health of the honeybee, the managed honeybee population in the U.S. and then trying to develop means to mitigate uh, the problems. And so our small component to this has actually been to get samples of bees from participating beekeepers and quantify the amount of virus that they have. 
Again, this is something that the viruses are not often symptomatic. So it's not readily identifiable that the colonies have um, a virus and how much of it. Uh, and so, but again, it could have very profound implications for overall colony health. And so what we do is we use these modern molecular tools, which is really the best and one of the only ways that you're able to, to measure how much virus a colony has. And so what we do is we use this process called quantitative reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, or QRT-PCR, or just PCR in general. Um, so that's a very fancy way of saying that we are able to measure how much virus is within a particular sample. And the way this is done, very, very simply, is we grind up the bees that we suspect may be uh, carrying virus, and we extract the RNA. Because again, the RNA, these are RNA viruses, most of them, uh, and so we extract out the RNA. And then we make CD, we make DNA from that RNA. So it's kind of going backwards in the standard um, genetic progression of DNA to RNA to protein. We actually go backwards and make DNA from that RNA. And then using that template DNA, we amplify sections of that DNA over and over and over again. So we start with one copy, you then have two, you then have four, you then have eight. And after many different cycles of this copying process, just like a Xerox machine, you're able to quantify um, and get large amounts of these copies of DNA. So if there were no um, RNA of a virus in a particular sample, you wouldn't make any copies of that um, piece of DNA. If you had a little bit of the virus, then the, um, the number of copies would multiply but do so very slowly. But if you had a lot of copies of the virus, then you'd make lots of copies very quickly. And so because of that, we can quantify how much of the virus is actually in these given samples uh, with surprisingly a high accuracy. And so in general, what we're doing is we're doing hundreds and hundreds of these samples, and each sample is a colony from participating beekeepers where we're screening not just whether or not they have viruses, but how much of it they have. So this is kind of the baseline figure that we currently have as of today, where we've run 1,200 colonies for all seven of these viruses, acute bee paralysis, black queen cell, chronic bee paralysis, deformed wing, Israeli acute paralysis, cashmere bee, and sac brood virus. And so what we see here is that um, the most prevalent, that is the most common virus that we've detected in these samples is black queen cell virus, where about 85 plus percent of the colonies have some sort of positive detection. Deformed wing virus is, is actually third behind acute bee paralysis. So those three are the most common. The least common are the ones with those black bodies, the chronic bee paralysis virus. So really not common that 95% um, of the colonies out there don't have this. But again, those that do, you usually see them, um, and usually at low levels. So this, is, this provides us and affords us with the largest baseline data of any virus study that has ever been done, looking at what the expectations are of how much virus um, is in the honeybee population. This then enables us to then generate reports for these participating beekeepers where we give them these baseline data. And then in the current sample, we actually show them how much of each of these viruses that they have in their colonies, and then whether or not the virus levels are higher, not significantly different, or lower than this baseline. So it gives the beekeepers a lot of power of saying, you know, my bees have a lot more virus than others, and they seem to be pretty sick, so this could be, you know, part of the problem. 
or otherwise if they're experiencing problems and th but they have lower levels of virus, they can say, well, this isn't the problem. It must be something else. I need to go check my varroa. I need to go uh, treat for nosema. Part of this report also, we have a breakdown by colony by colony where we say exactly which viruses are present and um, uh, how much relative virus it has, again, compared to that baseline expectation, and then give them a take-home message about whether their operation is higher, lower, or not significantly different from that average. So this is um, something that is a fee-based service as part of the Be Informed Partnership, and it's something where we accept the, the samples in by, by people who are interested in, in trying to understand what their virus loads are within their colonies. So um, the, the overall management strategies that beekeepers can use to try to combat these viruses. Again, this is part of the more frustrating aspects of dealing with these viruses, knowing that they're important for colony health but there's not a whole lot that we can do because you can't just treat with antibiotic um, and we don't really understand the uh, disease dynamics that goes on within the colony to be able to, to really make um, informed decisions about how to go about doing it. So a lot of the management strategies are common sense things that, um, that are logical in trying to assuage some of these, some of these issues. So um, ways of trying to reduce transmission from, especially from colony to colony, okay? Um, things that you can do as a beekeeper is uh, conduct some good apiary management. That is, place your colonies in good spots, know your neighbors, um, uh, especially if you have neighbors within flight distance. Um, you don't want your colonies to be going uh, and robbing theirs and, um, inadvertently picking up some of these viruses and can be spread that way. So make sure that you know where your apiaries are, where they're located in relation to other apiaries. Just good old common sense colony management is also a, uh, uh, one of the ways that we can reduce transmission of these viruses. Of course, regular inspections, be vigilant when it comes to the symptoms of the viruses that actually show it. Um, Keeping good records, when you do see any of these viruses, try to keep some sort of scorecard so that you can track over time whether these viral infections seem to be getting worse or not. Um, if you do have a colony that seems to be uh, very prevalent in some of these viruses, um, it's often a good time to try and quarantine them or move them away from your other healthy hives so that you don't have drifters or you don't have robber bees that may be uh, spreading that particular virus. And again, uh, removing uh, the weak hives and the dead outs from, from the colony, that just makes uh, common sense uh, for lots of reasons, including viruses. Another thing that I uh, am a big proponent of, and that is um, raising your own queens and, and buying your bees and queens from local sources. Um, you know, we are buying genetic material all over the country and bees are getting shipped from coast to coast every single year. Uh, and so um, if you're buying packages from Georgia and then you're buying queens from Hawaii, um, you know, we're spreading not just that, that genetic material but the viruses that are coming with them. We said before, the vertical transmission from queen to offspring is one path by which these viruses are, are spread. Um, if you don't know if, if the, the queens uh, are infected or not, which again, most uh, queen producers don't know because it's so difficult to measure those things, um, you know, you don't know what you're going to be getting. So raising your own queen, staying small, staying local can help. I should also mention that that's one reason why the Bee Informed Partnership is really focusing on partnering with those queen producers uh, that they comprise most of the beekeepers that we've been measuring these viruses for so that we can hopefully 
they can select grafting sources that have lower levels of these viruses so that when they make daughter queens, they're not going to be uh, selling them as they're infected. Uh, so that's one reason why we're starting uh, with that group in trying to um, measure virus levels in, a, in an effort to try to reduce them. So another uh, main management strategy is try to reduce the overall viral load. And again, this is where it's really difficult because there's really not a whole lot that can be done, or at least um, not directly. Uh, the best way, of course, is uh, vector abatement. That is, do something about the vectors of these viruses. And by far, the number one vector is varroa mites. So if you can keep your varroa mites in check by whatever means you can, whatever means you prefer, um, that's going to go a long way to preventing that horizontal spread of these viruses. Um, by just letting varroa run rampant, uh, you're not just letting the varroa build up and um, impact, negatively impact your colony. You're spreading those viruses around the, the colony as well. Uh, and it's, um, it's, it's often been said that varroa doesn't kill your bees. It's the viruses that the varroa are vectoring are killing your bees. So it's really, really important to, to mitigate that vector in order to keep a handle on these viruses because we really don't have a lot that we can do to address the viruses directly. Um, the same is also true for Nosema. Again, if that is a vector or somehow associated with black queen cell virus or, or uh, uh, some of the others. Another thing that you can do as a beekeeper is frame rotation. There has been some evidence, it's not huge, but um, there is some evidence that the viruses can persist for a period of time in the comb. And so uh, you can have a buildup of some of these viral particles that can be pretty hardy to, um, to living outside of, of bee tissues in some cases. And so rotating the frames can be another way to, um, to, to clean out the colony from some of the buildup of, of these virus particles. There is a, a treatment on the horizon that um, shows some promise for treating virus directly and knocking it down. And that's through this technology called RNAi or RNA interference. Because these viruses, again, are RNA viruses, that's the genetic information in these virus particles. Um, what the RNAi um, particle does is that it's a complementary section of RNA that sticks on to the genetic information of the virus and in essence turns it off so that the RNA of the virus doesn't replicate within the cell of the bee. And so it's a very powerful means of silencing the replication of these viruses and it's, it's a way to um, perhaps knock down these viruses even in sick and, and diseased individuals. Um, this is something that is still, uh, the technology has been around for a long time, but the application uh, and the, the product is, is relatively new and is still um, not very common and, and being worked out within the industry. I think in the long run, though, uh, one of the, the greatest hopes is to try and evoke some breeding strategies to get some genetic sources of bees that are naturally resistant to these viruses. So they're, they're not going to be as much of a problem or they're not going to be symptomatic. So even though the viruses may be around, they won't be overwhelming so that the bees are able to be healthy with high virus loads. Uh, so I think also breeding techniques and other genetic strategies are something that are on the horizon. But again, a lot of work has to go into this. Uh, for that to come to fruition. Okay, with that, um, before uh, we, we end and, and take some questions, I just want you to jot down on your calendars the next webinar that's going to be on January 14th, hosted by the Wake County Beekeepers. 
Uh, we haven't settled on a topic quite yet, uh, but there's plenty of time between now and then. Uh, be on the lookout for emails concerning uh, future upcoming webinars. Uh, but make sure that January 14th is going to be the, the next in this series, and we hope to see you then. And so thank you again, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions if you have any. You can either turn on your microphone if you wish, or you can type them in. It's uh, entirely up to you. I see a couple people typing some questions in. Dr. Toppy. Yes. This is Rockingham County. Have a question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Should we be reporting suspected virus infections, and if so, to whom? Yes, yeah, so that's an excellent question. Should should these um, problems actually be reported? Uh, and that's a really good question that um, I would say it's not necessary. Uh, and again, that's because we really don't know a whole lot in, in, in order to make any sort of recommendations about what to do. And we have very little power about what to do other than what we just went over. Control those raw mites and the vectors, rotate your comb, be vigilant as you're going through them. As always, in North Carolina, we have you know, the best apiary inspection program in the country, letting your local apiary inspector know uh, that you may be uh, experiencing problems just so that it's on their radar. But again, I don't think they're collecting any data because they don't have any regulatory authority or really a, a firm footing about what, if anything, to do about these virus infections. So, it's one of those things not necessarily um, that you need to worry about, but it could be one of those clues as you go back, if you have problems, you go back to your notes in conversation with your apiary inspector, that might be able to, to um, put some pieces together. Yeah, but that, that's a really good question about whether it's necessary to report, and I would say no. Um, it's not necessary, but it may be helpful. Anyone else? See a couple people furiously typing away, so I will. Make sure you hit the return button so that it sends the uh, the chat to me, um, otherwise I'm, I'm not able to see it. Can you see the three questions that are up there? Well, my goodness, that's why uh, it didn't it didn't continue to uh, to scroll down. That was my fault. You have been typing. <laughs> I just haven't seen them. I apologize. Oh. <laughs> okay, so here's one. Um, Seems like beekeeping is becoming harder and harder, hard to stay hopeful. Yes, this is uh, one thing that I always, uh, I, I always feel bad about, but I always feel like I'm the bearer of bad news <laughs> um, talking about these things. And, and, and that, is, that is very true. But um, I, I do hope to, to leave with a positive message. And the message is this, that these viruses have been around with our bees for a very, very long time. They may bloom, they may be exacerbated by um, these other problems, particularly varroa mites and, and other things. But the bees, they have uh, an ability to fight off these viruses. Just like it's, they're, they're like colds, uh, but once you, know, you have these other problems, then even a cold can become um, dangerous, right? So I think um, what's really good is that the bees are able to, to really um, withstand these things in, in light of them being so pro potentially problematic. I think the frustration of this is that um, there is a lot less known than there is known about these viruses and particularly about what we can do. So um, 
so I think we, we ought to remain uh, positive and, and not um, and be, be aware of the, of the downsides, but, but also recognize that there are a lot of upsides here too. Yeah, so my apologies for always uh, harping on, on the negative. I hope, uh, I hope that isn't uh, necessarily true all the time. Uh, here's a good question from Beaufort County. How long does a hive stay infected? That, that's a fantastic question because um, the levels of the virus go up and down all over the place. Um, so you can take a colony that um, is not very healthy you can measure the levels of virus and you have a really high level. And then two weeks later you measure the same colony and then they don't nearly have as much virus. Um, that the virus levels really can cycle tremendously over the course of the season or you know even from month to month. So there have been a couple studies that have really shown that over, over time at how much the virus levels fluctuate. And that might not be all that surprising, right? Uh, I, have, I have a cold. You measure my virus levels, they're through the roof. Next week, I'm better. You measure my virus levels, they're lower, right? So I think the same thing is true within the colonies. And it's the, 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 the frustrating part is that those virus levels don't always track with whether the colonies are healthy or sick. Um, compared to, say, us when we get a cold. So, you know, I think um, that uh, how long does a hive stay infected? Theoretically, for, for a very, very long time, the viruses kind of never go away. They're always in the background. So the real question is what causes them to bloom? What causes them to really escalate and cause the colonies to get sick? And that's something, that's a, a, a huge um, set of dots that we just haven't connected yet. Uh, there's a question about uh, other supplements um, such as uh, honeybee healthy uh, that could um, stave off virus. I don't know of any good controlled studies that have looked at that. Um, again, another one of those things where we, we know a lot less than, than we do know. Um, and so I, I just I don't know enough to, to be able to, to recommend anything um, besides uh, what, what was just said. Um, the RNAi technology and how it's delivered. Um, that's a good question. So they, they make large copies of these kind of silence, silencer sequences of this RNA and it's actually mixed up in uh, sugar syrup and it's fed to bees through the feed. And so then they ingest it and it gets into their bodies and it, it, and it turns off the, um, the, the virus replication. I've never used it or seen it, uh, but supposedly it's very, very tractable for beekeepers to use. Um, so uh, it's not something where you have to go and you have to actually inject every single bee or, or something like that. It's, it's, it's very user friendly from what I understand. Uh, so here's a, a question about rotating frames. Um, oh, okay, yeah, so my, my miswording, my apologies. So it's not rotating frames from position where you're, you're moving the inside ones to the outside and back and forth. What you want to do is you want to take the older cones and get rid of them. Get rid of them, melt them down in your wax melter and replace them with new foundation. Um, what we like to do, is we don't do it um, as much as, as we would like to because it, it, it is kind of hard to stay on top of it, but um, what we try to do is, is mark the, the top bars um, or at least a section of the top bars when we make new frames of the queen color year so we know what year that frame was made. And then every year when that color comes around again, we try to go through and pull out those frames of that same color and then replace them with new frames. So that's a five year rotation that we do that. I think a lot of books and, and a lot of publications have actually recommend replacing your combs every three years. Now I know as beekeepers we take pride in that comb that's been in there for 25 years and it's black as soot and you know we really, we really like to see that but there are some downsides to actually having such long-lived combs 
within our colonies. And so I think it's something that, that we can do. So, so really, the, the more frequent you can do it, but knowing that the comb and the wax is so energetically expensive for the bees to build, that you, you can't ask them to build new comb every single year. Otherwise, you'd never make a honey crop, right? So it's really up to you as far as what you're able to do in your particular beekeeping operation and, and the size of your apiaries. So outside the host, how uh, long will some of the viruses live? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, just call ignorance on that, that I'm not entirely sure. I know, I know that some of them do live in the comb, uh, and they can be infected uh, outside of the body for a period of time. Exactly how long that is, um, uh, it, it is certainly not like uh, American fowl root spores, which have been shown to be infected for decades, right? So I think they're a lot more fragile to the outside environment than, than say, bacteria and those, those other types of um, spore-forming things. But, uh, but they can uh, survive outside for, for a period of time, which makes the cone rotation recommended by, by the virologists. Let's see, let me scroll up here to see if I missed any. Uh, so here's another question. Um, are these viruses vulnerable to sunlight, cold, etc.? Well, um, they, they usually don't get much of an opportunity to be uh, exposed outside of the body of the bees. Um, so, you know, except through defecation, which is how it gets into the comb into the first place, and that kind of defecation oral route is a major horizontal transmission route for, for these viruses. Um, most of the time they, they stay inside the, the colony in the dark um, in a nice, humid, warm environment, right? Um, a honeybee colony is a really great place to be if you're a parasite. Um, so uh, they, they are quite vulnerable, again, compared to uh, American fowl root spores, which are pretty darn hard to kill. Um, they're a lot more susceptible to that. But by and large, they're mostly replicating and, and living inside the bees, so there's not much you can do, like chilling the bees or, or anything like that, that's going to adversely affect the, the viruses. That's a good question, though. Yeah, so, so to follow up on that, could we disinfect the combs in a way that, um, uh, that, that are left on for winter? Um, so the, I, I think, um, well, certainly the chamber in the NCBA, uh, that will even kill American fowl food spores. So clearly that will also disinfect them from, from the viruses. Uh, there's also been um, fumigation techniques of using um, acetic acid. Um, the, uh, vinegar, concentrated vinegar, uh, especially for the control of uh, nosema spores in combs. And so most likely that would be um, efficacious for the viruses as well. But again, um, because we don't, we know a lot less about uh, the viruses than we do um, some of those other diseases, it's, it's kind of hard to say. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, rotating combs is certainly not going to be a cure-all. Uh, but again, it's just one of those few things that we can actually do that we have control over. So um, that's why I think it's recommended. Um, the RNAi technology, how uh, soon will it be available for beekeepers? Um, I believe that, uh, so, so the company that is making this, the one that, that I know about at least, uh, is called uh, Remabee out of Logics. Uh, and Biologics was purchased by Monsanto, so it's actually a Monsanto subsidiary. And um, they are, the Monsanto is very interested in this RNAi technology. And um, from what I understand, that there are two products that, um, uh, the, uh, that 
Biologics is working on. One is specific to IAPV, that is Aurelia Acute Paralysis Virus. They're working on a second one that is a, a, um, a mixture of silencing RNAi for IAPV in the formed wing and I believe one of the others. Uh, that product, I don't, I think they're still working on that, but I think that the IAPV product is actually on the market. Again, I've never used it. Um, we, we haven't really seen a lot of this used in the industry. I think um, that it's still um, being introduced slowly and uh, it is being used by some beekeepers that I know out in California that have been using it. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's at, at the very least being slowly introduced. Um, so uh, it's something that we hope to do some, some trials on and, and just see when that really is kind of commercially available on a large scale uh, just so that um, we have some more local and regional information concerning its efficacy and, and, and how well that, that it functions. I should mention about the, the RNAi um, approach and the, and the technology itself. Um, what's one thing that's um, I think a real positive about that technology uh, is that um, this is a very specific section of, of RNA that is very specific to these viruses. Uh, so its cross reactivity to bees and other things is exceedingly um, minimal. And the other thing too is that it's not permanent. That you don't, the, the RNA um, breaks down uh, within a few hours or, or days. Um, and so it's not like a permanent genetic insert like genetically modified crops where we're permanently genetically modifying the viruses, the mites, or the bees. That this is um, uh, more akin to a medication than it is to um, to genetically engineering something. So, so I think that um, has real benefits to, uh, to providing some potential hope of, of trying to get directly at these viruses. Well, I think with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop recording and sign off. Again, many, many thanks to the Rockingham County Beekeepers. Glad you guys were able to make it. Thanks so much for hosting. And uh, everybody have a, a good evening. Thank you, Dr. Tarby.